Good afternoon, I'm Paula Dollarhide. I'm the Associate Director of Academic Advising. Today's Advising Brown Bag Colloquium is called Advising as Teaching Best Practices. And I'm fortunate to have with me five faculty members today who are going to share their own personal thoughts about advising. Recently, the Center for Academic Advising conducted a self-study and we interviewed both uh, faculty and students about their perceptions of advising. Faculty overwhelmingly agreed that good advising is critical to the teaching and learning mission of the college. Some 81% of the 865 students who were surveyed responded that they're very happy with their precepting experience. So congratulations to all of you. Comments from students, though, pointed out to the fact that they are very interested in developing the relational side of advising. In other words, they need more than just assistance with registering for classes. Our purpose today is to share our best practices in advising and get ideas from you as to how you approach advising. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion, and I hope at the end our audience members will be able to share their experiences with advising. So in order to introduce uh, our faculty members to you, I'm going to start by having them talk a little bit about their own personal philosophy at advising, what beliefs they hold true to, and, and how they approach advising. Can we start with you, Arnaldo? Sure. Um, for the purpose of being efficient and making sure that I um, include the information, the vital information that uh, I deem necessary. Um, here's what I plan to do. Um, first off, with, with language. El que no toma consejos no llega a viejo. The translation of this is he or she who does not take advice will not reach old age. At Stockton, advising is a shared responsibility. That's how I have looked at it. And I must first commend the professional staff and personnel, uh, personnel in academic advising. Day in and day out, providing academic services to so many students is an accomplishment like no other. I must also commend the many colleagues I often call or email for advice, especially during precepting and registration period when classes are closed. Yes, I am both a preceptor and I consider myself a non-traditional preceptee. So that's how I would like to begin my discussion as to where to go with this, this responsibility of advising. So I had thought of beginning my comments by admitting that I am a recovering preceptor. Recovery means to get back to a state of control, balance, and composure. It's a reflection on the varied, class, varied cases that I have seen and the common plight of today's students. So whether they are incoming freshmen or transfer students or graduate students, they, we, must all account for the following primary concerns. I will get into these later, but I just want to enumerate them. Uh, number one, time management. Number two, debt. Number three, transcript review. Number four, advising community or the advising community. Number five, internationalization. And number six, study abroad. I would like to end my, my intro to the uh, discussion by uh, saying that advising is a 24-7 job. It's not limited to a precepting day and it's not limited to your office duties. It's 24-7. I could be at home, I could be at school, I could be in the hallways. That's how I approach advising. Thank you. And that was Arnaldo Cordero Roman from the Language Department. Debbie. Hi, I'm Debbie Corbin uh, from the School of Business and I teach accounting. And Basically, my philosophy about advising is that it is an integral part of all that we do here, if not the most important part of what we do in teaching. They can get the content almost anywhere, but um, the assistance in deciding what they are going to do with what they are learning and what they're going to do in their future. And I think the most important thing I can do with the students is dare them to dream. Um, when they come in to me, I ask them, dream. What is your, whatever you want, tell me what your dreams are and let's see if we can make them happen. Wonderful. Rick. 
Uh, hi, Rich Trauma, Gen Studies. I tend to deal mostly with undecided students, so there is a component in terms of the advising and preceptorial uh, process that seems to overburden the students more because they have the pressure, and talk about debt and everything, uh, the pressure of I have to know what I'm doing before I could sit down and take a class. So rather than approach the process in a more um, prescriptive manner, um, as some of the pedagogical language puts it, uh, do this, do this, do this, take this, take this. I try to explain to the students that this is a mutual um, give and take. It's a process that is both giving and taking at the same time. And as such, that process incorporates dialogue, incorporates a discourse that has to go beyond just the classroom situation and the teaching aspect of take this class, take that class, that in fact the preceptorial dynamic becomes a model for a lifelong learning process that goes on beyond the actual four years that they're here or how many years that they're here. And in that term, in, in that way, there's much preparation. I don't necessarily give a syllabus out, though it's very practical to do so, but all my preceptees get a little email, make sure you have this, this, and this ready. And rather than take that, that preceptor, preceptee dynamic, I switch the tables around so that they're the ones leading the discussion and I'm the, they're showing me what they know and then plugging in and answering questions so that that dynamic doesn't become a simple power struggle where I'm up here and the student's down here and this is all they can do, that they are limited. But I don't I want to go into too many details. And Amy. I'm Dr. Amy Hadley, Associate Professor of Speech Pathology and Audiology, and um, I work in the School of Health Sciences. And although I don't feel my primary role as a preceptor is to point the students in a career direction, that is usually my initial point of contact, as students are interested in some sort of career study in the healthcare field. Um, I've been uh, practicing as a speech-language pathologist for almost 30 years now. So I really see my role with students as being a mentor and a positive role model. I found a profession that I was able to love and enjoy every single day that I engaged in it. And um, I want to help the students explore their own interests in hopes that they can find something that they find as enjoyable and engaging as I did. Uh, one of the tools that I use for that is getting them to network with other students and make connections and for us to form a community of learners so that students can also support one another. Thank you. Marissa. I'm Marissa Levy in criminal justice, I'm also the coordinator of the criminal justice program and that certainly influences my philosophy um, on advising. I see advising as a, a two, two sort of very separate um, concerns with my students. One is that I require that they meet with me during pre-registration uh, and if they don't I do place a hold on their account. Um, that seems kind of dramatic to some faculty members but um, ultimately what happens is if they don't meet with me and then graduation comes they're not able to graduate because they haven't met their course requirements. So I find that to be um, a useful tool in getting them into my office at least once a semester. Most of them, though, I meet with two or three times a semester. That might be in my office, before class, after class, by email, by phone, by Skype, whatever it means that I can connect with them in some way. And those meetings are more meaningful. Those meetings are about internships, careers, advice that they have about classes. Um, those are the more meaningful connections that I have with the preceptees. Um, unlike other preceptors, sometimes my job is to actually break the dream because in criminal justice uh, sometimes their past experience prohibits them from being able to go into certain career paths. So my job is actually not for them to have a dream and make, make that dream happen, but for them to have a realistic expectation of what jobs they can get after graduation. Hopefully that's their dream job. If it's not though, I'd rather prepare them earlier um, so that they can take the right courses to get on track for a job they can have in the field. So sometimes it's um, a delicate balance between their dream and what's realistic. Thank you for sharing your philosophies. 
I'm going to uh, ask a next question, and we didn't talk about how we were going to answer this, so you can just jump in. Um, do you believe that advising is teaching? And if so, what similarities are there between advising and what you do every day in the classroom? Are there some pedagogical techniques that are similar? Or how do you, uh, do you believe in this? And if, if you do, what do you see as similar to teaching in the classroom? I'd be happy to start that discussion. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at as a college um, for the last few years is um, what are the essential learning outcomes that we want students to have at Stockton? And I think these also carry over into the precepting process. So for example, some of the things we've identified are critical thinking skills, good communication skills, being able to adapt to change. And I definitely see precepting as um, a real life opportunity for students to start practicing those skills. Uh, many of them have been very good followers up until this point. Uh, perhaps that was their strategies for success in high school as they did everything that they were told by authority figures to do. And now we're asking them um, to sort of break away from the molds, take risks, make their own decisions, form their own opinions on things. And for some students, that's a very new and frightening experience. So um, we hope to be able to guide them uh, through those teaching principles so that they'll be successful in um, helping to decide their own long-term outcomes. Any of you have something to add? I uh, wanted to add to that that um, professors don't usually separate themselves uh, from being the preceptees. Uh, we all have the same concerns. Uh, for example, time management. When I sit down and speak with students about time management, it concerns me because it concerns my life also, how much time I dedicate to my own job, to my own profession. So when a student comes to my office, I ask immediately, how many hours a week do you work? And surprisingly, a lot of them say over 40 hours a week. So if you're managing or trying to manage a 40 hour plus work schedule, how do you reconcile the fact that a student is also engaged at the school with more than 12 credits? How do we account for that responsibility? It's a juggling of time and we all need to juggle time and to the best of our ability. So what I tend to do is number one, sit down and prioritize the time issues that we have, uh, the importance that we place on those goals, whether it's learning or whether it's working. Sometimes we have to take into account that there are other responsibilities that consume our lives in life. For example, commuting to school, family life. I have a student who ends her work shift at the casinos at 7 a.m. in the morning, and at 2.30 in the afternoon, she's in my class. There's a reason for her falling asleep. And it happens often, more often than we'd like to admit. Um, and that is a concern, and I often bring it up. And we need to recover from those lifestyles. How we do it, we do it through conversing, talking, and seeing if there are better ways to help each other manage our time. Mostly, the concern is, is that will they choose to live this way the rest of their lives? Because it's education is ongoing. It's a con continuing education matter. Does anyone else have anything to add? Sure. Um, <clears throat> rather, it, it is a form of teaching, but it's the ability, once the precepting takes place, outside the classroom especially, in that it's not a left brain dynamic anymore, but a more right, right brain. It allows a lot more circuitous thinking as opposed to linear thinking in the classroom. So what the student gets if we approach advising or precepting as teaching is a much more well-rounded ability to take responsibility for oneself and use the critical thinking techniques that any teacher uses in the classroom to go beyond that. And in doing so, that personal one-on-one -on -one that allows that more creative way of looking at time management mm -hmm. or the content area where the, again, pedagogical ideas becomes more relaxed, 
and allows a lot of openness between the student and the student's responsibilities, not necessarily between the student and the preceptor. But so do you see yourself as a guide in this whole educational process? In, in a developmental way, yes. Um, and although this, is, this may not be directly answering the question, in terms of how I sometimes, depending on the student, is um, use it as a chess game. And, but I teach them how to play reverse chess. And they come in with the material that I've asked them to come in with uh, through the emails and any type of communication. And they have something in front of them. So if I set it up like, all right, here's your situation. Practically, this is what we have to do. But here's your situation. How are you going to get from this side of the board to that side of the board? Put this on. What happens? What are your options? And that takes... That takes that, that following aspect away because all of a sudden they become in charge and they gather, even though with freshmen who are undecided, it's a nerve-wracking process. What happens is they be, their confidence over a situation, over a series of classes, over a semester becomes um, stronger. And they're able to then you know, as an undecided, then I could send them off to the preceptor who's going to be the program preceptor, and they're a little more confident with that aspect. So what happens in the classroom, because of the critical thinking things that I teach, the writing that I teach, specifically argument and persuasion, that dynamic lends itself to a precepting dynamic, and it becomes a more developmental process. That was one of the follow-up questions I had, is that you know, if, if advising is teaching and you have learning outcomes for your students in the classroom, it sounds like you're trying to find ways to get a student to engage and take responsibility. So there's a learning outcome, hypothetically, for their, their outside the classroom experience, precepting experience or advising. But is it an individual learning outcome? Yes, yes, a, 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 a class. For everyone, right. right. Do, you, do all of you approach your advising situations with learning outcomes? Do you have things you want students to be able to do as a result of the advising experience? I do. Um, I create an advising syllabus for all of my students so that they understand the basics of what they need to bring to the mandatory meeting, which would be the meeting during pre-registration. Um, but then most of the syllabus focuses on your goal for an internship or your goal for a career and what steps you can take to get there. So that when we meet during those other times that are not during pre-registration, they know that when they come to talk to me about certain aspects within criminal justice, they'll come with a knowledge base and then I can add to it. Or they'll come and ask me questions about my experience as a grad student and I can add to it. But that in that way, it's reversed role in that the onus is on them to come and to ask me questions, whereas in the classroom, I would be really asking them questions. And so that way, they have a better understanding of what the process is like and can start to develop some ideas on their own. I certainly won't let them go for two years without talking to me about any of those things. I will reach out to them if they haven't come to me to talk about those issues. Um, but mainly, that's my role in that capacity is sort of what resources can I help you to find your path? And so I might refer them to other faculty members in the program or refer them to other majors if it's not really a good fit for them. So it's sort of the same concepts, but in reverse. Anyone else have it? Yes, I, I um, often review the transcript, uh, sort of like an x-ray. Whether the student is an incoming freshman or a transfer student or just someone here uh, as a non-matric, we try and create a path with, with good objectives that would take them through life beyond the degree. Um, if they are lacking uh, courses, let's say, in personal finance or personal investing or even statistics, those would be good courses where they can fulfill their cues. They can also use them as at some distance courses and it will help them in the long run. It will help them think about, think about the debt they have right now, if it's good debt or bad debt. And I know that my colleague here is in business and she knows that there's good debt and bad debt. Education is good debt if they look at it in the long term and how that will benefit them to reach out to others and, and to just reinvent themselves later. 
Does anyone have any kind of strategies for dealing with students that don't take responsibility in the advising process? What do you do about a student who's kind of AWOL uh, that you never see? I know Marissa puts a hold, but we, do you articulate this to students that their responsibility is, is there as well? It's not just the onus is on you? Through email, through tracking them down. And, and it's a practical thing. I can do that because I only have, you know, 25 preceptees. So it, and, and because, again, most of them are freshmen, sophomore transfers, they're in my class to begin with. So it's not like they can't even escape. <laughs> and, and after a while, it's almost all right already. You know, I get the point. But once they see, if there are two or three in a classroom that I, I see two to three times a week, once they see other students who are my preceptees benefiting from their ability to make decisions on their own, they'll come around to it. So it's almost like using their peers in order to get them to come. Exactly. Even though the hold on is a practical reason too. It's just like there's, there's the first step. There's the first hurdle, like do you see what we're doing here? But. And I would agree with that also. I spoke earlier about forming a learning community and I think the students do learn um, from one another what the benefits are of meeting with their preceptor and of forming um, a long-term plan for themselves and knowing uh, what short-term steps they have to take care of to reach those long-term goals. So for example, for our students, many of them have to take the graduate record exam and move on to graduate school. So they know um, from networking with their peers that if they're not strong, for example, in math, they may need to take additional math coursework or take a GRE preparation course. And a lot of that comes from the peer network that we've established. Oh, I send several emails a semester, but I also, in almost every class, spend a minute or two, it's just a brief minute or two that's a precepting minute, at the beginning or sometimes at the end of each class. Um, so a lot of times I'll mention something at the beginning of class and then after class they'll be coming over to talk about it. So by, um, that really helps to get a lot of them coming and thinking. I was speaking with Debbie the other day that she is now t teaching her first transfer seminar. Yes. And uh, glowing about it, actually. Do you want to explain a, oh, a, the sure. transfer seminar? Um, it's a, a great experience. But what I um, did was I um, realized while I was working orientation that a lot of times when transfer students get here, there aren't a lot of class options. And I teach financial accounting, which is the first accounting class that they have to take. And so I decided to offer it as a transfer seminar on a test basis. I had some people say, well, we're not sure you're going to get enough students. It was overwhelmingly popular, and I'm teaching it with 52 students this semester, wow. <laughs> which is a challenge. Um, but it is the best experience I have had in a classroom here. The students are involved. They're talking. They're socializing with each other, with me. Um, they're active in class, and we're actually having a lot of fun. And um, I'm, I'm trying to fit in as much as I can regarding some of the Stockton things, but I do spend five to ten minutes at the beginning of each class as a Stockton um, background, and um, as part of my grading, I have added that they need to go to four activities during the year and write up on those activities. So. Um, We've been having a great time about it, and they talk about that, and they're really getting involved. So um, you can, I guess, make any class a transfer seminar, and um, it's been a great experience so far. Um, what skills and competencies do you think are necessary for good advising? I mean, all of us do advise that are in here, um, and I'm thinking about it on a daily basis and sometimes I feel really successful when a student leaves my office and other times I could have done that a little bit differently. So can you comment on what you think is necessary to actually think about doing good advising? Well, this could be the um, speech language clinician in me, but I really think um, empathetic listening is the most important skill and just um, not always being ready to blurt out the answers in response to their questions, but listening carefully and trying to use um, some Socratic dialogue to help them reach conclusions about uh, what the right decisions are they should be making. 
and, and not only listening what they're saying, but body language, um, like that, that trendy EQ, emotional quotient kind of thing, where you're reading the situation in terms of um, what their anxieties are, what their concerns are, that their words aren't, it's not only what they're saying, but what they're not saying. So that listening becomes not just an oral listening, but a, a sensory listening overall. And patience <laughs> and compassion. God love them. I think students are very perceptive. Um, when they appear to speak with you or with us, they want to see how well uh, we get along with others, not just with them, but what our networking strategies are with other colleagues. Uh, if you get on the phone because you need to answer a question, if I can't answer a question that a student poses, I just say, well, hold on a second, let me call so-and-so. And in that fashion, they see that you're actively involved and that you're connected. Uh, and if you work with them and they see that you can send them to other peers, to other colleagues, they will think the world of you. I mean, they'll come back and say, well, that worked out well. And it's happened so often that they establish other connections and make other commitments with courses and, and, and seek other goals. Um, another aspect that I often um, emphasize is that of um, looking at their transcript and seeing where I can fit in some minor concentrations. Internationalization, Latin American and Caribbean studies, languages, the minor in the language, they fear languages. There's a, there's a resistance to language learning. And I often give them the example, you know, why, why do you study English? Why study English if you're not going to use that language in, in another related discipline? Uh, look at that focus. Use the same focus for other languages. It's all about integration. I think an important lesson um, that faculty sometimes are afraid to use is honesty. Sometimes they don't um, want to admit they don't have the answer, and so they'd rather give a partial answer or maybe an incorrect answer to appear knowledgeable to the student. And so um, they don't realize that students kind of cling to every word that you say. And so you may have said something incorrectly and thought, oh, next time I, I won't say that, but never really correct it with the student. And then they have this in their mind that they don't need this course or that um, this one is not particularly important to them. Um, so making those connections, making those phone calls when you don't have the answer uh, is better than giving them false information but feeling confident <laughs> about that information. And I think one of the other issues is, um, that was already mentioned is really listening to the reasons why. You know, sometimes students will come to my office and say, well, can I withdraw from this course? Do I really need this course to graduate? And it's really not an issue with whether or not they need that course or something similar, but that they feel they don't feel confident in the language. And so I don't want to encourage someone to drop a course simply because they don't need, quote unquote, that course. Um, but if they're feeling problems with the language or they have an anxiety in math, I actually would want them to take more courses in those areas. So listening to what they have to say about the reasons why and just instead of just giving them a yes or no, you need that, you don't need that, is really important. And again, it comes down to time, because it takes time to develop a relationship with a student. How do you um, approach getting to know your students? Do you have time to get to know your students? Because that's what I'm seeing students are really asking for. They want to feel like when they come to the office that they count, that they matter. And research bears that out. So if we're all struggling for time, how do we get to know our students? And really more than just, here's the classes you need, but who are you as a person, and who do you want to become as a, a person, which I think is a very important part of their education, and they're growing from 18 to 22 years old and beyond. I meet with my preceptees um, as a group, as well as individually. And I find that that really helps them to learn each other. Because you know a lot of them come in as freshmen, and they don't know anyone. So they're scared to be here, too. Uh, so, And I have dual degree students, so they're sort of a unique class in and of themselves. So we have a session where we meet together as a group. And it's really informal, and it has nothing to do with the traditional you know, advising. We don't talk about course selection or classes. 
We talk about who they are, who I am. We talk about what you can do in the field in general, and just answer any questions that they have. And I found it's extremely helpful. In, in they see me as a person, not just someone who you know has a job here at Stockton. And they get to know each other, which really helps them to build friendships and move throughout Stockton in a good way. It's great. I know Amy has how many preceptees? <laughs> we stopped counting a while ago. But, uh, I'm also very involved with the student organizations on campus. And we do have a student speech and hearing club. And that's probably uh, my favorite venue for interacting with the students. Um, they're very active, and again, it builds towards that um, community of learners, and they support each other. We've developed a mentoring program through the club uh, where members can sign up to um, be mentors for other students. And um, every day there's something going on with the club where we're talking, we're on Facebook, or we're on email, or students are stopping by. and. I think that really um, gets an op gives an opportunity for the students to see me in a different role, even though it is um, still very much related to their academic and professional goals. And um, it gives us a, lots of opportunity for informal uh, discussion as well. I, I try also to embed the ultra credit um, goals and the objectives, having them uh, have more, a more of a participatory approach when they can go to lectures, um, especially uh, those lectures that are tied in with, with their interests, their hobbies, or their intellectual abilities. And it's, it's amazing that sometimes when they see you there with them, they will oftentimes repeat that experience and say, well, this is, this is a good learning experience. I can actually learn something other that I can apply. Um, most of my preceptees are upper class um, and which um, generally they switch over to me when they're in financial accounting so I have the benefit that they have already been in a class with me. Um, but I do take notes and I maintain files on all of them, and I'm very thankful for the photos that are available online that I look up before they come see me so I can actually act like, oh, okay, yes, how are you doing? <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about your own undergrad advising experience, what it was like, and if there was any faculty or advising experience that kind of directed you, changed your life, was meaningful or the opposite was negative. I mean, what was your undergrad experience like? Well, as a Stockton grad, <laughs> I would love to say it was a positive experience, um, but it actually was not a very positive experience. I felt bounced around from preceptor to preceptor. I never really felt like I had accurate information. So perhaps that has informed my role as a preceptor now. Um, and so I, I do think that that has had an, Im an influence on who I am as a preceptor now. Um, I don't think it was malicious in any way, but I think a lack of um, really understanding in some, t in some ways the curriculum um, and in some ways the importance of it and um, maybe some preceptors who thought, well, you, know, you can always appeal to Jan if you, know, you don't really have the exact right number of G courses. Um, and so that made a lot of anxiety, created a lot of anxiety for me as a student when I was here. Um, and so I really tried to make sure that students don't have that sort of anxiety now. Great. I would say the one person I identify as my key advisor, preceptor, <clears throat> to this day I admire as a role model. Um, the one thing that I wish I had done differently was I was in a program um, with a 90 credit Bachelor of Science um, major and I took a double minor in linguistics and Spanish and those courses served me very very well as a professional but I never had time to do the fun things. <laughs> so one of my favorite questions that comes up in precepting is what at some distance or which G class should I take? And I say, whatever looks fun and interesting to you. This is your time to learn about something that you've never taken the time to read about before. Um, even though we want our students to become lifelong learners, we know the reality is, is that once we get out of school, life kind of catches up with us, 
and we might not have time to take that fine arts class or that music appreciation class or something that we had the opportunity to take during our undergraduate career. So I do enjoy trying to um, make the students aware of the possibilities that they can do here at Stockton. Do you have something to add? Well, I was very fortunate. Where I went to school, there was a preceptor concept that I had absolutely no idea existed. So the first time I met with my advisor, I had my entire four years, and this is when I'm taking this semester, this semester, this semester, thinking that none of those classes were ever going to not be offered. And she was very matter of fact about it. And she took the piece of paper, looked at it, and just put it in a drawer, and then started talking about things that had nothing to do with the classes, not even knowing who she was, and then finally saying, well, you know, I'm your French professor, and this is what we're going to be doing, and this is what this is, and that kind of put the anxiety aside of all that, take this class, take this class, this is what you're here for, and became much more of, again, a dialogue and a go-between. Uh, with no means was it just that, because there was no, you know, think about this, think about this. But that was put aside, you know, that was secondary to getting to know the person. And what happened was that concept carried over, and I was very fortunate to have two or three other professors who were very nurturing in their, this is what you think about. So coming here, and, um, and knowing about this place because my father went here um, and hearing about his experience with you know, his advisor, um, it, it was only natural that, well, this is what was done for me, so this is what I'll do. So it, it just was, a, a, I looked out. Anyone else want to add? I actually had no advising whatsoever, and I think that has impacted it quite a bit. My, my, what I do quite a bit because I think about what I wish someone had been there to help me with. And so um, it has impacted my style quite a bit. Well, I remember a long time ago when I was a freshman at the University of Puerto Rico, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and my advisor asked me, what is it that you want to major in? And I immediately said, well, Spanish. English, I'm in Italian now, and phys ed. And she said to me, are you going to be here 10 years? <laughs> um, and it turns out that I was there nearly 10 years, but I was able to embed all of those courses into a master's program. So I do believe in dual degrees, and I do believe in, in coupling the educational experience with undergraduate and graduate studies. What do you think are the biggest challenges that you face as a faculty advisor? What are some of your challenges? We've heard a lot about your strengths. What's the hardest part about advising? Time. Yeah. It's only because of you have, you're out of class, but they're in class. And they want this kind of time with you, but you have this kind of time, so you have to really work at rearranging, using the time when they're in the classroom for this stuff so that when you do get them by themselves, that stuff's already taken care of. That's where the syllabus concept comes yeah. in really handy. True. But the time element is, it's because of that life gets, catches up with you concept. There is a practicality too. I have to be in class now. Follow me. You know. I, I would agree time and I think also the uh, cross-generational differences in um, the expectation for immediate results. So I sent you the uh, email at 11.59 p.m. last night, and it's 8 a.m. the next day, and I don't have my answer yet. Is there some difficulty here? So <laughs> you're just kind of navigating uh, those expectations of the digital generation. And do they read their emails <laughs> that you send out? Anyone else have anything to add about the challenges of advising? I think also uh, the, the cultural diversity aspect is very challenging. Um, for some reason, I get a lot of students that, that come from varied multicultural and linguistic backgrounds, and they seem to be more at ease with me, but it becomes more and more of a challenge when you want to direct 
their interests into certain courses and, and, and to persuade them that they can actually use all their talents and cultural upbringing to their advantage. That's, that's a real challenge. All of you are in different programs, schools, and when you have new faculty come in, there's a lot to learn. There's, our curriculum is quirky. Uh, transfer students definitely have issues coming in trying to understand the curriculum. And then you also have new faculty every year. Do any of you serve as faculty mentors, or how is that taken care of in your school, other than the efforts that we do through the Center of Academic Advising? It's ongoing. Any of you serve as mentors, or how does that work in your school? I can't speak for my school, but in my program, um, the new faculty meet with their mentor, and of course they go through their training for the Institute of Faculty Development. But then on advising day, we have them sit in with us with a couple different preceptors so that they get an idea of how different people precept differently. Um, that gets to the technical aspect of courses and, and scheduling and that sort of thing. Um, but we also talk to them about the career options and goals and internships and make sure that they're familiar with um, talking to their preceptees about a broad range of things, not just classes. Because many of the new faculty come to Stockton, they never had a preceptor. So they don't even know what we really do in a role <coughs> as a preceptor. They're used to seeing someone in advising who is just a course advisor. So we do talk to them also about you know, other ways to connect with the students beyond just transcript issues. And I think also um, emphasizing that the scheduled precepting days <coughs> are sort of a minimum expectation and that precepting really does occur throughout the academic year and to try to um, make your preceptees aware of that as well. Do uh, any of you use the scheduling tool in Blackboard now to schedule appointments for precepting? Are you finding that useful? Mm -hmm. Okay, I find it very useful. I also, um, with the Blackboard, find that the preceptees are more willing to email for some reason with the Blackboard course um, than just the regular email. I guess they realize it's there for them, so they utilize it, which is a good thing. Well, I'd like to get our audience involved now. Surely, after this dialogue, you have some questions. And if you do, could you just raise your hand, and, and uh, Tom will come by. And don't be, don't be afraid. <laughs> Any of you have questions? Can you tell me what you do when students ask or tell me what courses are not hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. I tell them that I am not a student here and have not taken any of the classes, so I really can't talk about that. I said, I also then tell them that they should take what they're interested in, that what one student may think is a hard professor or a hard class, another student thinks is an easy class with an e I don't want to say easy professor, but um, that I tell them different people have different perceptions and that they should make their own choices. When I get that question, I don't necessarily interpret it as um, which courses are going to be hard for me to understand, but maybe which courses are going to be hard for me to stay engaged with over 15 weeks. So very often um, when they're looking for something that they deem as easy, I'll point them towards courses that I know have um, either a service learning component or some sort of active engagement that's required in the course. Let me ask the audience at large, what are some of your best practices and how do you get students engaged? Can I ask the wider audience to respond to that? No, that's all right. <laughs> we know you're engaged. I'm out because I have a brown bag that I'd like to plug in this exact time spot um, in two weeks on the 23rd, so you're all clearly available. <laughs> so I'll be tracking you down. Um, so I'll just give you maybe a little prelude to, to that brown bag. Is I did some research about self-directed learning, having um, received the Academic Advising Pre uh, Provost Award last, um, last semester. 
last year. And uh, it resulted in just me wanting to have more than a, um, a more active relationship about advising instead of passive, instead of just picking those classes and things like that. So just having students take more accountability, a larger role in their, in their own learning. So a lot of what this panel said is, is exactly what I do, but really putting the onus of what you're going to take, when you're going to take it, where you're going to, where you're going to do your internship, where you're going to interview, um, you know, what you're going to look like uh, over the course of the next either two or four years, depending on if they're freshman or a transfer. So just more of that, you know, I call it hot potato. Just more of when they ask me questions, I really just ask more back at them. And um, an interesting thing I'm starting is a, um, an advising application because I tend to be frustrated over kind of like the most available person always being asked to be the advisor in a particular program or department. I see a lot of heads shaking here. So, um, so it's no longer just sure I'll sign that sheet. It's an application where I want to know more about you and sit down and if you're going to take the time to uh, answer a few questions and tell me a little bit about yourself and what type of advising do you need and you know answering then then there's just I need to get some buy-in on the front end more than just kind of signing that sheet and they have the person now that you know that they can come see for advising that's so that's idea. another thing I'll be talking about in two weeks just to really try to take a pulse and then that allows me to do what Debbie does do a little research on the front end and on auto um, just who is this person before they get to me? What what are they? Uh, what you know? What were their interests? What did we talk about last time? Crazy with notes on the folder. Um, you know where they work. You know I get accused by my colleagues in my department that I know their dog's name, that I know where they <laughs> live, that I know some of those things. But I'm a lot like Amy, where I kind of I'm in the hospitality and tourism management program, so I can't really go far without seeing many of my students outside of out of school. I can't really eat in a restaurant or go to a hotel or travel to um, many events that are going on in, in the hospitality industry locally without seeing my students. So I'm forever advising them even you know when they're at work or when we're out socially. So that's a little a little nugget to get you back here in two weeks. Thank you. Anyone else have something they'd like to add? Um, I'm in a bit of a unique situation in that I'm primarily assigned to the Social Works graduate program. Um, most of our students are taking classes all days on Saturday, um, as well as on Wednesday evenings. So we have a lot of difficulty getting um, our advisees into our offices uh, to speak with us about career choices, the classes they're going to be taking. Um, it's a highly structured program, so there's not a big need um, for them to be talking with us about elective choices and those sort of things. But I'm just wondering, um, do any of you have any sort of experience um, with, with this type of situation where you're advising at the graduate level? And um, what, what are some of your best practices um, in relation to those types of students? Um, we're in the second year of our Masters of Science and Communication Disorders, and we use a cohort model. So the students come in as a group, and they take all the courses lockstep as a group. But um, we do have um, requirements from the accrediting body that we are constantly checking to make sure the students are meeting the um, knowledge and skills requirements of the profession and that they're acquiring uh, those skills um, at the expected rate. So we have a curriculum worksheet that we use specific to the graduate studies and they, they must meet with their preceptor once a month or once a semester rather to update that and um, it's very similar in that it's a clinical program so we're updating things like what their clinical practicum experiences were for that <coughs> semester and making decisions about um, what future clinical experiences they need to have in order to meet the competencies. So it is very um, integral to the master's program as well. Okay, does anyone have anything else? I have one final question. And that is, I'd like for all of us to think about what do we want a student to value and appreciate after leaving Stockton? What do you think is the most important thing that you want them to be able to walk away with when they have their diploma in hand? Anyone understand the question? <laughs> <laughs> I think I can, I can begin. Um, when I meet with my students after, after a period of, of, of several meetings, I always try and, and persuade them of the importance of, of, of study abroad uh, and doing or participating in, in study tours. Uh, the transformation that occurs when they go beyond their borders, 
whether it's for the discipline they're studying or just to have the multicultural experience, but living away from their home state, living away, becoming more independent, learning about the world outside of their comfort zone. When they come back, they often thank me and they say they will always be going somewhere and even with their families. And that's, that's important. In today's world, that's very important. Linda has a comment. I think one of the most important things for them to take away from their, their time at Stockton, no, Stockton is the human relationships that they made while they're here. I think those are the things that they'll remember the most as they go through their career. The facts and the figures that they learn, they you know, it'll stick with them, but I think when you look back uh, to your time at Stockton, and I'm a Stockton graduate, and I made my best friend in the RNBSN program here at Stockton, So, uh, and it's not only the friendships, it was some of the professors that I had, and back in those days, uh, advising wasn't nearly as well developed as it is now, and so I think, uh, I'm with you, Marissa, I sort of like focus more on it because it wasn't very... Uh, well developed then, and it's such an important part. And I'll bet for many of you, the things that your students will remember are the relationships with you that they had. I agree. I think the connection um, that we have with our students is really what I want them to have when they leave here. Um, for a lot of criminal justice majors, that's going to mean a job reference down the line. That's going to mean um, an FBI agent or mm -hmm. is going to come knocking on my door asking about the person. And they're going to want to know more than, did he get an A or a B in a class? They're going to want to know about his or her character, how they interact with other people. So for our majors, it's really important that they have a connection to Stockton once they leave here, a meaningful connection. And that's the personal development that also right. should be a goal of all of ours, is to see them go from a teenager you know, to a professional or someone able to face the world. And they still have challenges, but at least we've prepared them somewhat to face those challenges. So I thank everyone for all of their comments. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists for being with us today and your insights. Thank you for sharing them with us. And let's give them a round of applause. Okay. Thank you.